Good morning. It is so good to be back. Um, I love the fact, I was just telling Ann that I, I love the fact that I could be on vacation and watch the service. I can see why that's such an important thing for us to do. It's just neat. It was kind of like being there, but not being there. I appreciated that. As you know, today is a very special day, Memorial Day. And I, I'm sad to tell you that, do you know there are churches in our country who will not be recognizing Memorial Day? There are churches in our country who will not have the American flag posted in their building. For me, I look at that and I think, why, why should we be surprised when there we're being comments about we're going to take one nation under God out of it when nobody is recognizing it in our churches? So we do just the opposite here. In just a moment, we're going to have a, a special video that's going to talk about how the fold, what the folds of the flag actually mean. Then following that, we're going to stand and we're going to have the pledges to the flag and one of our World War II veterans, David Duncombe, is going to come and lead us in the Pledge of the American Flag, and then I'll lead us in the Christian Flag, and then we will uh, have our opening prayer. Let's start by, I don't have really any announcements today. That's what happens when you come back from vacation. What's going on? Somebody tell me, because I don't know. <laughs> but be sure, our, our, we do have uh, offering baskets in the back. We will be giving you more information about the passing of Gene Combe. The funeral is scheduled for next Saturday and we'll have more announcements. We'll probably send out a, 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 a phone call to all of you letting you know what the details are of that. Friday. It's, it's, Friday. it's Friday, not Friday. Saturday. Okay, Friday at noon at? Stubbs Connor. Stubbs Connor. Right? Yes. Friday at noon, and I'd rather announce it now. Friday at noon at Stubbs Connor. So. Visitation at 10, 10 to noon, 10 to noon Service. and the funeral at noon next Friday at Stubbs Connor. Have I got it right now? Okay. Watch this video. <coughs> you stand and join us in the pledges of the flags? David, if you would lead us in the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Then if you'll join me in the pledge to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one brotherhood uniting all Christians in service and love. 
Remain standing as we sing together what ties us all together, and that is every day with Jesus. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Father, thank you that those words are so true. On a special day when we remember all those both those in the services as well as those in your service in the Lord's army that have given their lives to give us the freedom to stand here today and be able to sing without any question every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. May this be a sweet day in which we honor you, we praise your name, and demonstrate our love. It's in the name of your son Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you be seated please? Years ago, a minister in Columbus, Ohio, said, does your church honor Memorial Day? And I said, we do. And he said, well, do you do it often? I said, well, actually, to be honest with you, we celebrate Memorial Day every Sunday in remembering Jesus. That's what it is. The Sunday is a Memorial Day. But on the 31st, we do remember of May. What we did, and it was a powerful, powerful video that we saw today. We remember. You honor people by remembering them. Don't forget that. You honor people by remembering them. When you lose a loved one and you remember, that's an honor. When somebody has a birthday and you remember they have a birthday, that's an honor. It's a tribute of honor. So just don't ever forget that. We honor those we remember. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for those that are in grief. We pray for those that are ill. I pray for uh, the uh, Combs family for this service, writing for Gene, and bless them. Bless those who attend and remember his life. I think of Mark Dimbath and back in his nursing facility in Springboro. We lift him up, uh, 93 years old. Uh, what a powerful testimony to his life. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for those that we remember. We're not only remembering veterans who served in wartime. We remember those in our own family that we've said goodbye to. That's a reminder today as well. And we give them honor by remembering them. And most of all, we remember your sacrifice on the cross. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. As you've probably noticed in the, in the bullet and the message for this morning is hope in a state of hopelessness. So I've tried to have songs that have to do with trust and faith because that's what has to do with hope in a time of hopelessness is trust and faith. So join me in singing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. It's a different hymn. You know, when you have a song leader who doesn't read music, this is what happens. <laughs> this is what happens. Um, I think what we're going to do is uh, we're going to move on to the next song. 349. 349. Can you do that? That is trust. Oh, yeah. No, that trust and obey we're going to do uh, as our invitation. Tis so sweet. Tis so sweet. That's 350? Yes. And that's what we have up here? Yes. Can you read the written word too? <laughs> Sorry. I used to really like you. <laughs> what, what we were going to do is, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. And that's not the words. Okay, that's the song that we were going to do. Okay, what was I singing? Take two. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Because I think I am. 
I know, I'll never go on vacation again, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what we want. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the Savior. when uh, I have visited the nursing homes each every other week, I take communion to the residents at that time. And this last week, uh, Diane Canby and I went and we visited with Vivian and shared communion. And then we went down the hall and visited with Jan Jenkins. Now Jan hasn't had communion for months. And I still remember, I'll never forget the tears in her eyes when we opened the communion. And she said, now I'm going to need some help with this. And many of you that have used the self-contained, you know why she needed help with that. You need help with that. She, we opened that up, and we shared that communion, and the tears just came down her cheeks at the opportunity to finally share communion together. This is a, What Randy said is absolutely true. This is a time of memorial. It's a time for us to take that little piece of bread, that little cup of grape juice, and remember, we are saved because Jesus paid the price. That's what gave us salvation. Nothing else does. I don't care how good you are. It doesn't save you. Jesus saves us. Just a moment, we're going to sing, and then John Spence will come and have our communion meditation, and then we'll ask you to join us for communion. We're gonna use my faith, looks up to thee as our communion hymn. Take 
in Flanders Field, the top is blown. Between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago, we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders Field. Take up our quarrel with our foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If you break faith with us, though poppies grow, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. And Flanders Field was written shortly after World War I by Colonel John McCray. In remembrance, I read it today, in remembrance of the over 1.6 million men and women who have given their lives for this country. As we prepare for communion, let us reflect what Jesus said in John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Heavenly Father, thank you for laying down your life for our sins, and for your forgiveness, and for your unconditional love. Be with us, and guide us, and in your name we pray. Amen. Won't you come and join us for communion? A lot of congregations have the privilege of having somebody who has played trumpet, has led, led to orchestras for so long, come and do special music by trumpet of all days on Memorial Day. We have that privilege, and we'll recline. We'll be bringing our special music today. In 1861, Julia Ward Howe visited a Union camp and camp in Washington, and she heard the Union soldiers sing the song. John Brown's body lies a moldered in the grave. John Brown's body lies a moldered in the grave. Julia didn't like that. So she went back to her room and began to pen and write verse to her. And uh, some of you might have thought that I was there to help her. I really wasn't. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like but she wrote this song called The Battle of the what our veterans did. Uh, 
Anytime that you go to a cemetery, especially now, look at the flags. If you've never been to Arlington National Cemetery, you don't know what you miss. Thousands of miles. And I've been there a couple of times when a caisson would come by bearing the body of a, of a deceased veteran. I wish local cemeteries would fly the flags 24-7, 365 days. But if you walk through the cemetery, and I challenge you to do that, walk through the cemetery and see the flags, or see the flag standards, or see the, the markers of people who have given their lives. That's pretty serious stuff. What did they give their lives for? I've talked to a couple of guys we're in the middle of battle. And he said, we were not fighting for the United States. We were fighting to survive. But people who have served our country need to be honored every day of their lives. I don't know about you, but I pray for our military every day. And I just wish the Lord Sunday would do the same. But they have, they have fought Bled and died. And even if they hadn't been in combat, combat, com combat, they would serve our country. The high meat is a flag. They fought for that flag. It's a grand flag. Well, some of you were in church a few years ago, a number of years ago, when I came to church and I said at the beginning of the message, uh, the phone rang at our house at 6 or before a.m. I mean, it was early. I was in a dead sleep when the phone rang. I saw the area code. It was 267. I did not have a clue where 267 was at the time. And I answered it. And... Uh, a woman was crying on the other end of the line. And I, she said, are you so-and-so? And I said, ma'am, I think you've got the wrong number. You've called Dayton, Ohio area. And she said, I'm so sorry, my mother just died. And I'm calling friends and family around the country and I misdialed and I called you. And I surprised her, I said, can, can I pray with you right now in the loss of your mother? And we did, we prayed on the phone and then we prayed for her that morning. Some of you were here that morning when that happened. And we prayed for her. Somebody didn't know. You say, why are you bringing up that? Well, the area code was 267 Philadelphia. I don't know anybody in Philadelphia. Nobody. I don't think I've ever met anyone from Philadelphia that I can recall. But there was a famous minister in Philadelphia that I read his books years ago. Donald Gray Barnhouse. Donald Gray Bar Barnhouse. He was talking about having a conversation with a man about his relationship with the Lord. And sometimes, because it's happened to me, you can actually make people angry. 
by having a spiritual conversation. People get mad. And so he brought up the subject of the Lord to somebody, and the man got mad. And finally, in anger, with a raised voice, the man said to Donald Gray Barnhouse, What does God want with me anyway? What does God want with me anyway? And I love the answer that Barnhouse gave him. I never would have thought of it. Here's what he said, Sir, God wants to be believed. God wants to be believed. If there were a proof text for that statement, it's the passage we read today in Romans 4, where God demands belief. More than anything, and I think after you read this with me, you'll see that God wants to be believed more than anything. Because here's what he does with belief, and it's an accounting term that's used, I think, 11 times in this chapter. When we believe in the Lord and what he did on the cross, it's credited to us. It's an accounting term. It's like an entry made into a book, a ledger. God credits that to us as righteousness. And we think about Christianity keeping the law and keeping rules and doing this and doing that. And God says, what I want from you is you to believe in. We're going to read about hope in the midst of hopelessness, and that's it. David's absolutely right, but we're in Romans 4. We're going to bring that up, Romans 4, the first three verses, and then we're going to jump to verse 18. The Apostle Paul says this, What shall we say, then, of that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified, which is a legal term, justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Underline that in your mind, if not in your Bible. It was credited to him as righteousness because he believed. Jump to verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God was, had the power to do what he promised. Listen to that again. God had and has the power to do what he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. And the words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, for you and me, to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins, but raised to life for our justification. I've got a story to tell you about being having credit, credit to you, your account that will help you understand this thought. It was credited to him as righteousness. It comes from Columbus, Ohio. First church I served as senior minister for 18 years was in Columbus, Ohio. That's where I met Randy Webster. Colonel Randy Webster at the time turned out to be general. Having no idea that Randy Webster, I, I had dealings with him and the 907th Airlift Group there at Rickenbacker International Guard, Guard Base, had no idea that I would be the minister to a family years ago with Randy and Jennifer, or Rick and Jennifer, and Randy and Martha. Martha's here today for, I'm sure, for the graduation. But here's what happened. A friend in Columbus, anybody heard of the Huntington National Bank? I know there's some in Dayton, but you can't go anywhere in Columbus without seeing a Huntington National Bank. We have a little Huntington National in our little community where we lived. But here's the most interesting, one of the most interesting stories I've ever heard. One of the men, young men from the church had a job where he was paid every two weeks, and he said, Randy, we lived paycheck to paycheck. Anybody know what that means? You, you've been there and done that. We live paycheck to paycheck. And he said, Randy, one time years ago, he's telling me about his account. He said, I looked at my accounting statement from Huntington National Bank. There was a $500 deposit there. 
that I had made. He went to his wife and said, did you make this $500 deposit? And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. Where would I get $500 at the time? And $500 in the late 70s, early 80s was a lot of money. You know what he found out? Legally or illegally, somebody got his account number for his bank account at Huntington and made an anonymous deposit into his account for $500. And I remember exactly when he told me, he said, Randy, I didn't earn it. I didn't work for it. I didn't even know about it. But my account was credited, logged in, $500 deposit. Help me to understand Romans 4, probably more than any illustration I could give you. It was credited to Abraham's account, righteousness, because he believed God. He believed God. Now, here's my question to you. You know, it's important, it's important to us what we believe. We tell people, well, I believe this, and then we hold that up, and that's important. You've got to respect what I believe about anything, politics, whatever the case may be. And the Lord says, what do you believe about me? What do you believe about the cross? What do you believe about the, the resurrection? Some of you have heard of Augustine, known in the Catholic Church as St. Augustine, who said that he believed earlier in his life that he needed to understand something in order to believe it. So if I'm going to believe in God, I need to understand God, and I need to understand Scripture. And so he was in the position that the more I understand, the more I will believe. And then he came to the point, he said, in one day, he said, wait a minute. I need to believe God. And then the other stuff, the understanding came. I think there's truth to that. Belief is the first point of coming to the Lord. We believe God, and then as we believe in Him, and believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, and believe in the cross, and believe in the resurrection of Christ, and the hope of the resurrection that we have in a hopeless situation, we understand more. Some of you are still in the phase, you're trying to understand God, get this, and don't be offended by this. You need to just come to the place where privately in your heart and in your soul say, God, I believe you. And I believe what Christ accomplished on the cross. I'll tell you that we have, there's nothing about that that brings uh, honor to us. It's all about him, not us and what we do. When I was in high school, Hammond, Indiana, there were two or three people that went into ministry that I remembered at the time. And it wasn't until 10 or 15 years later that my mom came to me, or we were at home, and she said, do you remember a, a young man you went to school with by the name of so-and-so? I said, yeah, I remember. He's now in the ministry. And I thought, that's interesting, because I, I never thought about him being in the ministry at all. And I said, you know what, I'd love for you to go here and preach. I'd like to hear what, how, what you think, and I was sincerely interested in what he preached about. And she went and heard him with my dad, and they heard him two or three times. And then I said, what did you find when you heard him? What did you learn? And she said, we enjoyed his sermons, but he, she said, he does something that's rather dis, disconcerting. I said, what do you mean? He said, through his, each sermon we've heard, he will stop and say, isn't this a great sermon? <laughs> Isn't this wonderful? I am so blessed by my sermon. And the thought occurred to me, not in a condemning way, it's not about us. We don't congratulate ourselves in a self-congratulatory way. It's all about the Lord. Isn't it great what the Lord has done for us? Isn't it great what happened on the cross that he conquered death? And because he lives, we shall live also. I want to share a powerful story about that. Lynn Scott was from, and may still be in Alger, Ohio. Anybody know where Alger, Ohio is? I have no idea where it is. I just know it's up north. Her story is going to touch somebody in a powerful way today. At age 25, I said I do to the vow of in sickness and in health. 
I remember looking at my soon-to-be husband, Darren, and thinking, no problem. He'd been a national wrestling champion in college and was still in prime athletic form when we got married. And get this, not many husbands can say this, because I sure didn't do this. He said, when, we carried, when he carried me over the threshold on our honeymoon, I had no idea that 12 years later, I would be carrying him on my back up the stairs of our home. Do you get that? Wedding day, he carries her over the threshold figuratively and literally. Twelve years later, she's carrying him up on her back, holding onto her back up the stairs at their home. You see, one year after our wedding, Darren experienced massive leg cramps. Two years later, the ailment had a name, amotropic lateral sclerosis, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. There's no cure, and at the time, no treatment. By the time Darren was diagnosed, he had already lived the average time that most people with ALS survive before they die. He lived 10 years more before the disease literally took his breath away. Unlike most ALS cases, Dave Darren's was genetic, so we decided to not have children. Now this is an unbelievable statement, this next sentence. Can you believe that Lynn said a close family member suggested that I divorce Darren and find a healthy husband with whom to make a family. She said, she looked with shock at this family member, I don't know, it was an in-law or somebody who said, why don't you divorce him and marry someone who's healthy to make a family? I admit, she said, there were times when I wanted to run away. Sometimes I felt trapped fixing his meals, keeping the house to his cleaner than my standards and providing the majority of our income. I remember the day I wanted to drive headlong into an oncoming truck in 18 Wheeler. My husband couldn't run away from his body. He couldn't drive to find the truck's path. I stayed with Karen. We made vows to each other before the Lord God Almighty, and we loved each other until death parted us one night as I was reading him to sleep. Now here's the point I want to make. Lynn Scott, Alger, Ohio, was in a hopeless situation from the world's point of view it was. But she had hope because of the one she believed in. And the one she believed in, it was credited to her as righteousness because she believed and she was able to find hope in hopelessness. What's my point? So can you, and so can I. And the hope that we have is not in a philosophy, it's not in a concept, it's in a person, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. What do you, I wanna look at a few verses here individually. Let's look at verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. He's a hundred years old. He said his wife's womb was also dead, and yet God told him that he was going to be the father of a great nation, or nations, plural. And verse 21 may be one of the most important verses for you today, because being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. And then the inclusions verse is verse 23. The words that was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sin and raised to life for our justification. You know, do you know there are people that are offended by those verses? You say, Randy, do you know what I've done for the Lord? Do you know the things I've done for the church over the last 40 or 50 years? And we're quick, I am too, to point out what I have done, what I have done, what I have done, to the point we obsess over that. And the Lord says, what do you believe? And it offends some people that a man or woman who can reject the Lord for 40 or 50 years of his or her life, and at near the end of their life, they say, I believe in Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and I accept Him as the Lord of my life. And, and they reenact that death, burial, and resurrection of Christ through baptism. And you see that, and, and we resent that. Man, I've been faithful to God for all these years, and what's it done for me? And I want you to go back to the very first three verses that we read. 
if verse 2, if in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to brag about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You know, I've been preaching for many years, 46 years, I, I forget how many years it's been now. And sometimes I'll use a story and then find out something more about the person later. And this is the case. Tim Barnes is a lawyer from Clarksville, Tennessee. When I knew of him, he was just a lawyer, you know, family attorney in Clarksville, Tennessee. But he went on to become a, a politician in the state of Tennessee and served in the state assembly, et cetera, et cetera. And I think was a state senator on, on the state level. I want you to just listen to a couple of paragraphs here. I grew up in a very conservative home in the Bible Belt South. I've never heard anyone say this. I learned to attend church the old-fashioned way. I was forced to go. I listen to that again. I love that. I learned to attend church the old-fashioned way. I was ordered. I was forced to go. I attended every service, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every revival meeting every night at vacation Bible school. If the doors were open, my family would be there. And he said, God was a big part of my life until, until the summer of my 11th year. My older brother returned from Vietnam that year and the whole family was extended and the extended family was overjoyed to have him back and unharmed. I learned about worry that year he was in Vietnam. You see, I saw it in the faces of my parents. But I also learned about the relief and the unburdening my parents felt when he finally came back home and was stationed in Little Rock, Arkansas, just two hours from home. Now, I want you to get the picture. Parents are worried. He's worried because mom and dad are worried. I could see the look of worry on their faces. Finally, his brother came home, stationed at Little Rock, Arkansas. And then the night came, he said, was the night my family received the phone call that my brother, while traveling back to the base in Little Rock, had been killed in a car accident. What an absurd thing to happen. He had survived Vietnam, was stationed two hours from home, and then killed in a car accident. It was absurd to me and cruel. And get this, his honesty, I hated God for that. 11 years old, I hated God for that. In the months and years that followed, I lived in my parents' grief. For the first time in my life, I saw my dad cry. I wanted to help, but I couldn't. I hated God for it. But then he talks about years later, listening in the car to a song sung by Alison Krauss. I think I remember who she is. And she's singing a song about heaven. My darkest night will turn to day and the soul of man never dies. My father, who had died just two years earlier, 34 years after losing his son, never lost his faith. I suppose he always listened to the words of that song and believed them. And those words sustained me, even through the darkest night. So I listened, and my seven-year-old son, Fergus, listened. And I thought, what an absurd thing to believe. What an absurdly good thing to believe that there could be this place where there is all peace and joy and how the love and the soul of man never dies. So he's listening to this hymn by Alison Krauss, her song. Turns the radio off when it's over. And seven-year-old Fergus speaks up and says, Dad, I like that song. He said, so do I, son, so do I. Where the soul of man never dies and it was a rebirth of his faith. In Jesus Christ at that moment as a seven-year-old son by saying just a simple phrase I like that song brought his mind back to the cross and brought his mind back to the Lord brought hope in hopelessness you know what my prayer for you is today as stunning as this may sound or as crazy as it may sound that this could be a day where you come back internally mentally spiritually to the Lord and that maybe there's been a time in your life or a phase of your life where you were like Tim Barnes and you believed in the Lord and you never missed a service and then you got to the place where you, 
He knew. He said, I hated God. Losing my brother in Little Rock, Arkansas. What impossible, hopeless situation could you be going through right now? I'm here to tell you there's hope. Not in a concept, not in a philosophy. Hope in a person. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Donald Gray Barnhouse was absolutely right when the man said, what does God want with me anyway? God wants to be believed, sir. That's what the Lord wants you to do. He wants you to believe in him. Because of what happens as a result of the belief. Things don't happen in your life and then you believe. You believe and then things start happening spiritually. That's my point. When you believe in the Lord and you trust him, you start seeing him work in the lives of your family. You still see him work in the life of people around you. And he start, you start seeing him use you to be a blessing to people who call you at six in the morning. And they don't even know you. But you say, can we pray for you? I, I'm just going to leave. I didn't plan this in the message. But could you try to think of people that would help if you said, can we pray together? I'm convinced, I really am at my age now, that praying for people and praying with people just may be the most important thing that we do because you know what I'm going to say. Oswald Chambers said it's, prayer is not an addendum to the ministry. Prayer is not something you add to it. It is the ministry. To pray with people and for people. Be a blessing. Be a symbol of hope in a hopeless situation because of the one you believe in. His name is Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this passage that is the proof text of belief. Belief is not something magical we do. It's not something, you know, occultic we do. It's the most important thing we do in terms of our relationship with you. We believe in the God we serve. We believe in the Christ who died for us. We believe in the Christ who said, I'm coming again. We believe in the Christ who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, he or she lives. That's power. Power that comes from belief. Bless this decision time this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. David. This message is pretty simple, and the decision is pretty simple. It's stated very easily in the song we're going to sing as an invitation. If you believe in the Lord, you trust and obey. It's not really tough. If you believe, you trust in him. And if you trust him, you obey him. And obedience to him is coming and saying, I believe Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I believe he told me to be buried in those waters of baptism. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to rise to walk in newness of life because I trust and I obey. That's what you're asked to do this morning as we stand. As we see. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still. Then in fellowships 
something different this morning. Uh, if you have prayer concerns, please call them in either to me or to Randy, any intercessory prayer, because we're going, to we're going to end in a very, very special way. In just a moment, I'm going to ask those who can, those who can't, please just stay here and pray. We're going to go outside and we're going to join in a big circle around our flagpole. And we're going to be praying both just for a moment. Now, we're not going to be out there a long time, but we're going to be praying for our soldiers, both our soldiers in the military, as well as our soldiers like you or that were soldiers of the cross. And we're going to close in prayer together around that flag. And then we're going to close with Wilbur playing taps for us as our closing for this morning. So if you would make your way as quickly as possible, uh, probably the door to my left, the main door, will be the easiest way, and we'll circle around the flag. <laughs> 